following is a presentation of Main Street Media, your source for news, sports, and information on Main Street in Middle Tennessee. Thirty years of the best sports talk in Middle Tennessee, featuring Tennessee Radio Hall of Famer George Plaster, Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame coach Watson Brown, and Young Guns, Billy Derrick, and Michael Sendrick. And now, here's your host, George Plaster. Hello again, everybody. Welcome in. It is a beautiful Wednesday in Nashville, Tennessee. The weather is beautiful. There's not a raindrop in sight. Hasn't been for weeks. That's not helping our yards. But it's probably the way we want it during football season. Let's start in on what is a busy day in the world of sports. Let's call roll. Let's start up on the plateau. Say hello to Coach Watson Brown. Watson, how are you? <laughs> I love that little wave. Yes. How are you? Is, is this Corso's wave? Yeah. yeah but... Th this is my wave. And then he goes, not so fast, my friend. Uh, not so fast, fast, my friend. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's this. A lot of times. Me. Yeah. That, that's mine. Yeah. It's and great that, to have you with you us. We won't say what that means when I do that to you, okay? Yeah, I, I, I think there are a couple of A and B, and neither well, one of them we'll are any good. We'll let it ride. I'm not yeah. going there. We'll just let neither it one of them are any good. Let you let's think about in. it. Watson, let's check in with Terry McCormick, who's sitting in a car near you. Terry, How are you? take us through a tour of the car. Well, George, I'm sitting in the driver's seat. Now, I'm not driving and doing this while I'm driving, so okay. any of your – police officer friends don't alert them don't alarm them There's nothing going on i'm pulled into a parking lot here in the lovely city of portland on my way home portland and, uh, oregon <laughs> portland tennessee no and uh giving you your daily titans update that way and oh. celebrating number 62 your legitimate all-time single season home run leader aaron judge on this you and i totally agree he is the legit home run king because he's done it the right way. So Terry, let me ask this. Would, if you had caught that ball, what would you have done with it? Boy, that question came up at practice today <laughs> among the reporters. And I said, I would give it back to judge. And somebody said, you're lying. You would get every dime you could out of it. <laughs> <laughs> See, I would give it to judge. I would, I would. Now, if he played for some other team, if, if he was, if they were playing Texas or any other team, then it's off to eBay to the highest bidder. Really? What do you think this thing is worth, honestly? What What are you hearing? Oh, gosh. I'd say it's probably worth a couple of million, wouldn't you think? Oh, Something like that. That's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. It's but, I mean. Ball. Somebody's <laughs> dog is going to get a hold of the thing. That's true. But, I mean, George, we live in a world, maybe you've heard of inflation. There was a Mickey Mantle 1952 baseball card that sold the other day i think for 12.6 million dollars watson only offered nine million watson how could you have been so uh so cheap i don't know just trying to take care of mickey i guess i don't yeah. know yeah wow <laughs> so um it was interesting the various things that came out roger maris's son came out and and did something on Twitter about the fact that this is a clean home run champion, which was an obvious shot at Barry Bonds and Sosa and McGuire. And then Bonds came out on Instagram 
congratulating Aaron Judge. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, because, you know, people are, you know, this is one of those things that people are divided on in terms of, you know, what to do with the steroid era guys, Bonds, McGuire, Sosa, Clemens, that whole bunch. You know, there's some people who would claim that, you know, there are steroid users or suspected steroid people already in the hall now because there were some people who have tried to tie it to Mike Piazza and David Ortiz hasn't really stuck, but those two guys are in while these other guys are not. And I think in some ways, the reason some of these guys are not, especially in the case of uh, Bonds, McGuire and Sosa is that they uh, they use the steroids to basically assault the baseball record book and the records that are hallowed in the game. And uh, when they accomplishment accomplished it, a lot of people cried foul. So Terry, besides that, what did you see today at practice? At the Titans? <laughs> no, at the Jacksonville Jaguars. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, you broke up for a second there. I didn't know. I was just making sure you had switched the topic from uh, baseball to football. But, well, now, uh, hold on. Watson had... was laughing, too. I'm not the only one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, hey. I mean, he's so deep like into the thing. Yankees, he forgot what he's on here for. <laughs> oh, you mean the Titans? <laughs> <laughs> All I right. Don't you, I don't blame you. I don't blame you on that one. That's like a good one. The clock. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's yeah. a good one. You mean the Titans? <laughs> Looks like I got got. But you got got. The guys who were missing today from the Titans practice, <laughs> not that you guys care about the Jaguars, uh, the Titans practice, uh, Bud Dupree, Traylon Burks, Zach Cunningham, Joe Jones, Ola Adangi. Some good news, though. They were able to get uh, Amani Hooker, who missed last week with a concussion, back out on the field. And also, they activated Monty Rice, inside linebacker, from the PUP list into his window of practice time to see whether or not they want to activate him back onto the 53-man roster. Well, what's your gut feeling on Burks as to how serious this is and does he have a chance to play Sunday? I would think he gets held out at least this Sunday. Then you've got the bye coming up. I would think he might have a better chance after the bye. This turf toe thing that it was reported to be, you know, that can be a fairly serious injury. And if you don't uh, take care of it and get the proper rest and treatment and rehab from it, it can come back and then make it worse. So I would look for Traylon Burks to be missing this week uh, from practice and the game against the Commanders. Okay, anything else you want to share with us? Well, you might want to go to TitanInsider.com, George, because I talked one-on-one -on -one with Josh Gordon today. You know, he's been kind of MIA in terms of uh, what the Titans have done with him thus far and uh, gives you an update just kind of on where he is and uh, how he feels like he fits into this offense and uh, how long he thinks it might have to take before he's up to speed and ready to go. Um, are you hopeful in his situation or reading between the, the lines here? Do you think this is that he already would be out there? Well, you would think that he would already be out there, but with Burks missing likely this week, I got a feeling that Josh Gordon could be pulled up to the active roster for this game and, and get another opportunity. It's just, uh, you know, kind of interesting that you know a guy who spent 11 years in the NFL is now languishing on the practice squad they've called him up a couple of times but really haven't used him but now with Burks out it appears that if they're going to put him in there he's got to have some kind of role beyond just playing two or three snaps when the other guys are winded yeah Terry is always good report thank you all right see you guys later Terry McCormick's daily Jacksonville Jaguars update here on the show. Did you like that, Watson? I like that, George. Yeah, that was a great moment. That that was that was one of the one of the funnier moments of the show. All right.
Daily Titans update. That was not the Jags update. That was powered by the Justin Tucker team, as well as Sumner Funeral and Cremation. The Justin Tucker team with Platinum Realty Partners, they are proven to be trusted with your most personal asset. Call them at 615-906-8458. Also, Sumner Funeral and Cremation, they are sharing their family with yours in your time of need. Now with two convenient locations in Gallatin and Hendersonville and online at SumnerFuneral.com. Sumner Funeral and Cremation, traditional, affordable, and dignified. Okay, let's get to the update outside of all this. Billy, where are we starting? We're going to start in Indianapolis. Jonathan Taylor is out tomorrow night, Thursday night football against Denver due to an ankle injury. He didn't practice this week because of the injury. And, I mean, we saw last week he's most of their, not not only offense, but most of their team. I mean, that that's a huge loss. Watson, this has got a chance to get Matt Ryan absolutely destroyed in Denver. Their front four is going to tee off on Indy. Yeah, Hines is a good player now. Yeah. The backup that plays behind Taylor, I mean, yeah. he he's a good player. I don't think it'll be as big a fall off as you think. And he's better in the passing game than Jonathan Taylor is. So, I, I, I don't, Taylor is a great player. And you know he got hurt on that fumble. Yeah, that's they twisted him sideways and got his his ankle underneath him, and that's when he uh, let the ball go from. I think pain from the ankle is what created that fumble when we bent him over. Item number two. Item number two. Cole Beasley has announced his retirement. Tampa Bay Bucks wide receiver has announced it. Thirty three years old. He's been in the NFL for eleven years. Seven of those, of course, with the Cowboys, and it comes after signing with the Bucks just a few weeks ago. So. Um, he's going to be a full-time dad and a husband now, so so good for him. Here's an ugly thought. Who has played less for Tampa this year? Cole Beasley or Julio Jones? Julio Jones. Oh, man. <laughs> Could you? I don't know if you saw it, but Cole was sitting on a bench during the game late in the game over by himself. I really felt sorry for him. Yeah. These guys have great careers. They try to hang on too long and because they just want to keep playing. And he just wasn't getting any opportunity. I knew he was going to be cut this week. I mean, yeah. I, or I thought he would, unless you're Julio or Godwin or somebody's out for a month. But it was sad to see him sitting over there, knowing all the things he had done in his career, George. That's the, but it's NFL, man. It's it's professional sports. It's yeah. professional sports, and you just hope and pray. How many I've had get in the league through football. And, and a good many of them not have anything when they get out. I wish these guys would just take care of themselves better while they're playing because they think it's lifetime, and it ain't. It doesn't grow on trees. What no, else, Billy? Well, George, I, uh, I surpassed this one. This was actually number two. Uh, Mike McDaniel is apparently not upset about the criticism surrounding Tua Tungavailoa and that injury and how they handled that, uh, but he is aware of what people's opinions are. Uh, but he says he isn't wasting thought on them. So he's, well, uh, I don't know, take that with a grain of salt. Good. Let me add to it. I think they've butchered this. I think whether they fell for Tua's little story about his back think- issue or they wanted him out there just as much as he wanted him out there, what has gone on here is wrong, period. It's wrong. It, it's it's wrong, George, and – it's wrong on one person's part. Whoever made the decision that he could play, it, what, whoever that doctor is, because I'm, I'll, I'll defend the coach. I never, ever made a decision in my life about somebody playing or not. That was never made by me. Right. Now, if it, did, it was as a starter, backup, something like that, but an injured guy coming back, I never, ever made that decision. And, and, um, uh, I, I just I will defend that with the coach. Somebody had to tell him he's okay to play. Now I'm not talking about a, a trainer says you sprained ankle. He's still got it, but he's capable of playing. And then I might say, well, he can't run well enough to help us, so I'm not going to play him. But a head, neck, I never ever touched that. And I'll bet you the coach didn't either. And two is probably in the coach's office begging him to play. Yeah, I just well, bet you. I think a couple of things are going to come out. Number one, I don't think Tua was totally truthful. I've been saying that for a couple of days. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's going to come out. This whole back thing, 
I think is a load of crap. And I think a lot of the NFL players knew it on Thursday night when he got hurt. A bunch of them were tweeting out, why is he even out there to begin with? And secondly, Watson, I don't doubt that inside the Miami Dolphins organization, there is a pressure being applied somewhere to get those players back out there as quick as humanly possible. I do not doubt that. Uh, would not argue that with you whatsoever, but that's where you have to have strong doctors. Yeah. Uh, I, I can tell you my trainers that I've had that are really good, and it was the strong ones. No, they could tell I wanted him out there playing. Is he well enough to play? Can you get him back? John Norwick, who was my trainer at Vanderbilt and went, is still with the Steelers today. Buddy, if he said no, that's it. Yeah, I, you like those guys that are strong and just stick by what they say. And if this doctor was kind of wishy washy and and then Tua begged everybody, you got to have a strong person in that spot. And 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 I also throw a little of this on the trainer. Where was he in all of this? There's a yeah. doctor that makes that decision, but the trainer's right beside that doctor when Absolutely. all this is being done. So where was the trainer? He's his name hadn't been mentioned in all. The doctor's been fired. What about the trainer? Yeah. Okay. A little bit of what we're going to do on the show today. There'll be a lot of SEC football talk. In a moment, Billy will catch up with Vanderbilt football coach Clark Lee. Then we'll get some of Watson's take on where Vandy is or where they aren't as they get ready to take on the Ole Miss Rebels Saturday here in Nashville. Then at 5 o'clock, we'll talk with Matt Moscona from ESPN Radio in Baton Rouge. He is wired deep into the LSU football program as they get ready to take on the Tennessee Volunteers. Congratulations to my Bravos. It took 15 minutes longer than you thought it would for me to say it. They are National League Eastern Division champions. I'm a happy camper. This is Main Street Media Television. Buying or selling a home can be a very personal experience. Why not go with the team that receives nearly all of their business from referrals? Clearly a trusted name in real estate. The Justin Tucker team with Platinum Realty Partners has sold more than 500 homes in the last seven years. Voted best in Sumner County multiple times. Proven to be trusted with your most personal assets. Call the Justin Tucker team with Platinum Realty Partners at 615-906-8458. The Justin Tucker team with Platinum Realty Partners. Middle Tennessee's most trusted team in realty. I highly recommend Sumner Funeral and Cremation because of their caring nature and attentiveness to detail. Pre-planning your funeral now will bring you peace of mind and less stress to your loved ones. When the chaos of losing you happens, your family can honor and celebrate your life, knowing things are happening just as you wanted them to. Pre-planning determines the details of your funeral, cemetery services, and can be less expensive. We are honored to serve you and are always here for you in your time of need. Sumner Funeral and Cremation. Traditional. Affordable. Dignified. SumnerFuneral.com Jody Jones Dentistry can handle all your dental needs from the basics to cosmetic procedures. All of this in the nicest dental facility I have ever seen. Jody has done it right. They're located conveniently at 55 Music Square East and for an appointment, it's simple. Dial 615-259-5100 and tell them Plaz sent you. When you're thinking about golf, consider Riverside Golf Links. Under new ownership, the course has improved dramatically. It's now 27 holes, complemented by a nine-hole executive course. Book a tee time now at 615-847-5074 and get ready to enjoy the beauty of golf in the Old Hickory area at Riverside Golf Links. I'm Bart Durham. I was sworn in as a lawyer in 1963, and I've been working as a lawyer since then. We're a firm that does exclusively personal injury, a lot of tractor-trailer crashes. Insurance companies will open up their checkbooks when you force them to. 
we have systems that work. We get the most money for our clients in the shortest amount of time. I'm Blair Durham. My dad and I want to help. Give us a call at 615-242-9000. This is Eric Barner with Rock Hassle Wealth Advisors. I help people in the pursuit of making their money live as long as they do. People hire me because I use a customized, individualized, and personal approach for the person I'm working with. Everyone's situation is different. If you've lost a spouse or a parent and want to make sure your inheritance is utilized and does not just disappear, I can help with that. Call me at 615-235-1058 or email eric at rockcastlewealth.com. We are back. Vandy and Ole Miss go at it Saturday here in Nashville. It's a 3 o'clock kickoff. The game is on SEC Network. And earlier today, our own Billy Derrick over there caught up with Vanderbilt head football coach Clark Lee. Here is that interview. Coach, you got Ole Miss coming to town, another SEC opponent. Uh, they are another top 10 team, 5-0. and uh, You guys sitting at 3-2, and of course, coming off the bye week, had Two weeks to prepare uh, for this matchup, 3 o'clock Central Time at First Bank Stadium. Bye weeks are always interesting. I, I know different coaches have different approaches. Uh, of course, you just mentioned to me before uh, we started here, it was good to get healthy. So uh, was, that, was that one of the, the bigger things you guys were able to accomplish? Yeah, we, we you know, early here in the year, we've, you know, we think we've positioned ourselves well. Um, we've also, um, you know, been going for a while because we played week zero. So it was time for a little break and we wanted to, the guys that have had a lot of uh, exposures as far as reps go, we wanted to make sure we were in our bye week practices being mindful of, of getting their legs back underneath them. Um, and given some of the players that you know haven't had as many reps, getting them more work, um, we were able to do that. We were able to get uh, guys back healthy that we need um, to, uh, to build our depth. And, um, and then we've had you know some three really spirited days of work here this week where I felt like we've tapped into our identity and, and now it's kind of the, uh, the scaling down and the preparation for the game. So um, I'm pleased with where we are. We have a, a, a big challenge ahead in Ole Miss, but um, that's exciting and, and I'm looking forward to watching these guys go out there and compete. Specifically at the running back position, Coach, of course, Ray Davis has been the bell cow and I'm sure uh, he might have liked to have a couple other guys there behind him in that running back room, uh, maybe for a little bit of rest. You get Rocco Griffin back, you get Patrick Smith back as well. You know, not sure how much those guys are actually going to be able to play, but of course it's got to be good for Ray to, to actually give him a little bit more rest than he's had. Yeah, well, Ray's a competitor, and I think that he would take every carry in the game <laughs> if it was up to him, and so would the other two guys, you know, and that's what you want. You want you want guys that are, that are hungry to be out there and to, to help to impact winning, but Certainly for us as an offense, you know, those, that's three really good weapons um, that give us opportunities in personnel and formation to add a little more stress to the opponent um, and uh, having them back healthy. And, and you know, now, <clears throat> again, particularly with Rocco, being, being, uh, having a third week now where he's back um, and confident and healthy, um, it gives us a chance to explore kind of, um, you know, how we can help the, the offense run and the team win. Coach, A.J. Swan a couple weeks ago in Tuscaloosa ended up playing him the whole game. Was that something you guys before the game wanted to, to try to do with A.J. to say, hey, listen, we, we know it's on the road, we know it's Alabama, but, um, you know, was that something you guys really wanted to accomplish with him to, to kind of experience that? Well, early in on his t time as a starter, you know, we wanted to make sure that he felt um, ownership over the position and, and that he could learn through his mistakes. I didn't, I didn't want him, you know, feeling like, he was a part of rotation or, or, or even that, you know, he wasn't able to go out there and, and, um, and make mistakes and, and, you know, that somehow that would get him pulled out of the game. Um, every rep he takes as a true freshman is, is um, experience, the building of experience. And so anytime you play a freshman at any position, you're going you're gonna to have to have some patience um, because they're going to have to learn on the move. And A.J. happens to be, as a competitor, you know, mature, um, 
young player that, uh, you know, um, I, I've never seen the moment get too big for him. I've never sensed that, um, you know, he, he's, he's backing down from the biggest stages. If anything, his consistency is what has delivered him to this point. And so, um, you know, we, we wanted to give him a chance to work through issues, to learn from the experience, and uh, he'll be better for it. Coach, you said you like where you are right now coming out of the bye week. Go a little bit deeper in that. What do you like most about where your team is right now mentally, but also physically, of course, because, you know, almost halfway through the season, um, you know, health, I think, is the most important thing. Well, we've been able to get some guys back here in the last two weeks that will, that will help us sustain through the season. When you, when you have injuries, it's not just about the loss of a player, it's about the tax on the other players too because you're not rotating as many people through. And um, particularly when you play against a team like Ole Miss that has a high tempo offense, you're, you're gonna look to get as many people on the field as you can and, and we're gonna have an ability to do that. Um, and so that, that's a plus. Um, and then, you know, being three and two, obviously, you know, we've lost two games, disappointing um, performances on our end, but, you know, to two good teams that, um, you know, we can learn from and, and grow through those experiences. Um, on the whole, I feel like um, the team is in a way different position this year than it was a year ago. Our best football is still out in front of us, and, you know, Vanderbilt controls a lot of what happens down the road. You know, we have to continue to focus on our improvement and our progress. Um, we can't sit back and make any assumptions, and each week we're going to be tested and challenged, and the margins are very thin for us. But um, it's exciting to be positioned where we are and to feel like, um, you know, as we continue to get better, that the, the results will follow as well. Coach Ole Miss leads the SEC in rushing. They got a couple of guys that, you know, could be the best duo in the conference. Um, you talked yesterday in your press conference about the different ways they like to establish the run and, and kind of surprise you, keep you on your heels. Uh, so so what, what is the challenge for that in defending a, a heavy run style offense like the way they are? Well, <clears throat> you know, you, you, you face um, different modes or methods for an offense to attack you. Um, and over the course of a career, you know, you see run games like armies and navies that the tactics are really challenging. Um, and then you see some teams that are spread in tempo and it challenges you in different ways. This is a team that has two really good tailbacks, also a quarterback who um, has, has been effective as a runner as well. And they, they will use him in critical situations to run the ball. Um, I have a lot of respect for their offensive design. I think um, you know, it's like by any means possible is the way they, they approach it and that's how they're going to score points and they're gonna, that's how they're going to accumulate yards and convert first down. So uh, between those three people, um, you're going to have, you're going to be taxed in terms of the strategies, but also you throw the tempo involved in that and it softens you. And so we have to be uh, focused in each moment to be where we need to be, when we need to be there. Um, with the right demeanor to tackle because these guys are going to be able, have the ability to break tackles and uh, certainly if they catch us on our heels off a tempo drive they're going to be able to score touchdowns and um, it's, a, it's a unique challenge but you know again as a competitor it's one that you look forward to because we want to play against the best when they're at their best. Returning home for an afternoon kick at First Bank Stadium, uh, you talked about yesterday how you haven't really liked the way your guys have played at home. You know, there's there's more out there for the team to to, to play in front of the home crowd. Um, a lot of alums coming back, of course, more of a homecoming weekend. Um, does that add a little bit of excitement, energy, type of buzz around around this this program heading into an SEC opponent on Saturday? Yeah, it, it's it's not something we spend a lot of time on just because, you know, we're we're focused on the play that's on the field. Um, and yet we'll draw energy from that um, because, you know, any any player or any team does. Um, you know, we want to we want to put together a high level performance in front of our home crowd and in our home stadium. And that that's what I'm uh, referencing, you know, being disappointed. It's not you know, it, it, we, we've been too inconsistent at home. And, um, you know, I thought against Elon, we put together a really good first half and then, um, you know, just didn't play true to form in the second half. And against Wake Forest, we just, we, you know, we, we allowed them, I love the spirit that we came out with in the game, but we allowed them to create distance between us uh, based off turning the ball over. And um, I would like to see this team come out and play to an identity um, you know, to, 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 to be a, a tough 
um, and and um, high effort team for four quarters, and to um, and to really take control of all the things that we have control over, and that's our own performance. So let's execute ball security. Let's see if we can get Ole Miss turned over. Let's see if we can gain possessions for our offense. Let's see if we can control the game offensively and convert um, on drives and extend drives and score points. And then next thing you know, you're in a tight game late, and um, and that's when we're going to call upon that home crowd to to um, to give us the advantage. But um, it's an exciting thought, an exciting vision. We got work yet um, until we're putting the ball down, but um, we'll, we'll be fired up to play this game. The Ole Miss Rebels rolling into Nashville for a 3 o'clock kick on the SEC Network. This is Coach Lee of Vanderbilt Football. Coach, thanks for taking the time. Great to be with you. Watson, let's start. Uh, we'll, in the next segment, get into where we think they are as a program, but Tell me a little bit of what your early thoughts are on A.J. Swan. Oh, I think he's played really well for a, for a young guy that's not played yet. Uh, I see a confident kid. I see poise and confidence in him. Um, you know, I, to me, George, you can't have poise if you don't have confidence. Poise comes from confidence. Confidence don't come from poise. It's it's you got to have the confidence piece first, and I haven't seen him – bat an eye on going out there no matter who it is. Uh, so I think he's going to be a really good player. It How quick will he become that? Only only time will tell. And we'll see if he's better this week after the Alabama game and going into one of the tougher places to play against maybe as good of an opponent as he'll play all year. Come back home now and get to play an Ole Miss team that's not as good as Alabama. And uh, we'll see where he is. But I think he's got a great future. He he looks to me like the guy that can can be here for four years and 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 help bring this program back. So I think they've hit that person. Or if you're the head coach right now, are you committed to him for the rest of the season? You nearly have to be when you made the move as quick as you did. I think when you when you've got a senior captain or an older kid, I don't even I don't even know if Davis is a senior, but an older ca captain of your team and you bench him for a brand new player that hadn't played yet, you're basically saying it's yours, go with it. And I just think uh, it would take a lot of poor play uh, to for him to be benched again and bring the other kid back. They made the decision. They know he's young and he's going to make mistakes. I think they, they made it in a way of he'll, we'll grow with him as he grows and this football team will get better as he gets better. Watson, I guess I'm a little baffled. There's a third quarterback, Ken Seals, who was good enough a year and a half ago to be a starting quarterback. And I sit and I look around at a at a Texas A&M that's got quarterback problems. I look at an Auburn that's not quite sure where their quarterback situation is. Are you surprised that Seals hasn't left and at the end of the season doesn't, if if he has a desire to play, doesn't he have to get out of here? Well, he, he for sure does now if he desires to play. If he desires to stay and help in any way he can with a positive attitude and get that Vanderbilt degree, more power to him. Uh, it's his call. But he will leave at the end of the year if he desires to play because this offense was taken away from what he does and, and put into two guys of what they do best. And what – Swan does best what David does. Davis does best does not fit Seals at all. So I think the change of offense basically took him out of the picture. And uh, so big decision he will make in December. He will be he will have that red shirt year because he played as a freshman. I think best I remember he did right. Yes. So he'll have a red shirt year to be able to go somewhere and have maybe three years still to play. Uh, that's going to be interesting to watch uh, because I've I've had many Vanderbilt kids that were going to be backups and help the team and that stayed because they wanted that Vanderbilt degree and they were very willing to play the role that I wanted them to play and did it with a very positive attitude. George, it, a lot of kids don't leave those type schools, Vanderbilt and Rice being two I was at, because they just – they came there – as much for the degree as they did to play football. And so that's a big decision to make. 
Okay, after the break, Watson and I are going to talk about the Vanderbilt program. They're three and two right now. What is it? Where are they? Where are they not? What do they got to do to start getting a little more attention from everybody? Stick around. This will be an interesting discussion. This is Main Street Media Television. <laughs> For Dustin Timmons and Joey Donnelly, they welcome every opportunity to serve and satisfy their clients. Whether you are looking to build your dream home or renovate your current home, their team will ensure that every client and remodel is unique, luxurious, completed on time, and within budget. Contact them today to set an appointment for a free consultation or to view some of their completed projects by logging on to DonnellyTimmons.com. At WellSkin Dermatology and Aesthetics, we pride ourselves in providing access, innovation, and a patient experience second to none. Access to care and treatment when you need it. Innovation with medical-led cosmetics and various on-site technologies for full-service treatments with a customer experience that is calming, casual, and effective. Independently owned, providing medical, surgical, pediatric, and cosmetic dermatology and more. Visit WellSkinMD.com to schedule your appointment today. WellSkin Dermatology and Aesthetics. Access to healthier your skin. It's your last chance to get a spring tune-up for summer. Complete Service Heat and Air can clean your coils, check out your motor, and make sure you have cold air on that first hot day of summer. Complete Service Heat and Air is located in White Bluff, Tennessee. We do service and repair on heating and air the right way. 24-7 service. Call us at 615-797-3997. That's 615-797-3997. Serving Cheatham, Davidson, Dixon, Hickman, Humphreys, Montgomery, and Williamson counties. Have you heard about the high levels of radon in Middle Tennessee? Radon gas is the second leading cause of lung cancer, second only to smoking, and has no color, no taste, and no smell. The only way to know if you have radon is to test for it. Duret Radon Mitigation offers testing for small and large-scale residential and commercial properties plus mitigation services. Visit DuretRadonMitigation.com to request testing or get a free estimate for mitigation. That's DuretRadonMitigation.com. Since 1865, the First Baptist Church of Gallatin on Winchester Street has served its community by catering to the least, the last, and the lost. Providing a church of welcome, used by God to save the lost, transform the saved, and impact its community. As a proud multi-ethnic congregation, Pastor Derek Jackson personally welcomes you to join them in fellowship Sunday mornings at 8 in person or at 1045 in person or online at firstbaptistgallatin.org. First Baptist Gallatin on Winchester Street, serving with open arms as a true church of welcome. Sounds like the Titans uh, drum and bugle corps is alive and well as we welcome all of you back. So, Watson, I've been pretty consistent in my belief that Clark Lee inherited a pile of crap uh, when he took over this program. I have no idea what Derek Mason's staff was doing, but what Clark was left with, I wouldn't wish on anyone trying to compete at the SEC level. My gut feeling at the moment is Clark has done about everything that one person humanly can do. 
How about you? Yeah, I, I do. I've said that before. I think they've coached them much better this year over last. Um, I think that was a growing, growing pains kind of year also with coaches and learning to coach in the SEC and what you're going to go against, what style of stuff you can run, what you can't with the players you have, the discipline, the confidence, uh, just everything is better in a coaching way. That's what I've seen so far this year. I think they're better as, as players. I think there's more talent in the program than when he walked in. I think, I think they're about a quarter of the way there. Um, where I, I think the skill players are, are pretty solid. They can line up in the SEC and play, especially the on the offensive part, side. Especially on the offensive side. I'm not sure about cover guys just yet. Uh, where I think they're still short is talent and depth in the offense and defensive lines. And I'm talking about mature talent. You can't bring a freshman in unless it's one of those five stars that's just different than everybody. You yeah. can't bring those guys in and just say, well, that's, he don't look that much very talented. You can't be talented till you get bigger and stronger and faster when you walk in. So, but, George, I think we're going to know. I think Saturday is a big look and see where they are because Ole Miss may be ranked in the top ten. That's not a top ten team. That's my personal opinion. They're not a two-way bunch. They don't throw it near as good as they did last year. Uh, they run it well, but they their quarterback makes a lot of mistakes. The defense is solid, but it's not Alabama and Georgia, and I don't even know if it's LSU. And uh, so I'm anxious to see where they are. I'm, I'm anxious to watch them against Ole Miss, against South Carolina, against Missouri, against Florida, because I don't think Florida's near the old Floridas that we've seen in the past. So I want to see them against those four and see how they hold up. Uh, but what I think I'm going to see is what I just went over. And uh, he's just got to keep going. He's got to keep recruiting, developing, and coaching. Those three things, keep recruiting. You really got to develop them at Vanderbilt because you don't get the five stars. You're getting three stars and maybe a four-star here and there. But you're playing three stars against five stars in the SEC and a lot of these schools. You have to develop what you bring in, and then you got to coach them really well. And so that's the three things he's got to keep doing that I think so far he's done a good job of. Okay, to me, nobody should be fooled by three and two. Hawaii is as bad a Division I team as maybe we've ever seen. Uh, Elon is Elon. They're they're not Division I. Um, Northern Illinois is not a very good football team. So Watson, yeah, it's nice that they're three and two, and that's good for all the people that are coming in for homecoming who have no clue what the hell's going on. But don't they have to, for real progress, to be able at the end of the year to say, this ship is moving up, don't they have to get one SEC win and, and, and maybe take a second that is way better than them and scare the daylights out of them? I'm not going to go wins and losses. I want to go competitive and see where they are. But, George – being three and two is not okay. It's fantastic. I mean, that's given them health. That's given them confidence. Uh, they've played a lot of people in a lot of those games. They could, if they were sitting here one and four right now, that would be awful. I mean, right. that this the the schedule they played is perfect for Vanderbilt right now. Now, where will he be in the SEC? One hundred percent agree with you, but. We also can see if they were to win one, but they're very competitive across the board in these games. I mean, mm -hmm. they don't get blown out again like they did at Alabama. They start playing these people very competitive and then all of a sudden sneak up and win this one. I think there's a lot of ways we could grade them this year to make them better without just the one loss record. They weren't competitive last year much at all. Will they be this year? Played one, weren't. They have not been, but they played the best one in the league on the road. 
So let's see where they are this week. I think this is a big game. Open date, two weeks to prepare. Ole Miss had to play their hearts out Saturday to beat Kentucky. Uh, pretty banged up. There were people left the game for Ole Miss that were banged up. I just really believe I want to see the competitiveness. I think they should be able to compete in this game a whole lot better than they did the Alabama game. Watson, one thing that is apparent to me under the you, – you look at different areas of this program, and this has been a Vanderbilt trait for a long time, and so he's inherited this. They get zero pass rush unless they send the kitchen sink. And at some point, that's going to get you. No, he's got recruit and develop. That's what fixes the pass rush. There is no design of pass rush that'll get you there. It's called players. I always said you can tinker around with less players on offense. On defense, huh, you got mano y mano. You got to line up. Yeah, you can bring a blitz here and there and maybe stop a drive. But if you want to rush the passer like a lot of these SEC teams can, like LSU can, that's fixing to play Tennessee, it's players. And he's got to recruit. And he's, and he's a fourth of the way there. The first class, first real class that he's brought in this year is solid. Got to keep going. And honestly, I always felt like they got to get better every year, which in my first couple, it didn't. We we did not bring in enough good players. And then finally, late in my time, we did. George, you look back and look at those last two classes that you watched play after I left and watched sure. them as freshmen and sophomores when I was here, and you watch what – we played with early in my time, daylight and dark. It's recruiting, and he's got to get better players. And so far, he has improved that, but he's got a long way to go. Watson, in the interview with Billy, Clark Lee said, we have not played our best football, our be or something like our best football is still ahead of us. In your mind, what is their best level of football uh, what 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 can they achieve? What they do best, they got to be better at. You can't turn it over like you did Wake Forest. You turn it over three times, you have an intercepted pass for a touchdown. That may work at Alabama here and there. It ain't going to work at Vanderbilt. So you got to take care of the ball. They just got to play better. And I think they can play better on offense. This offense should improve week to week. I worry on the defensive side that I'm just not sure how good we are. And when you can't get a pass rush and then, I mean, 385 yards against us at the half against Alabama. Yeah. 385 at the half. It's a lot. That's, that's not getting on Clark at all. I think that's talent. I think Clark, that's still – Inherited. It's, it's still what he's dealing with. And, you know, George – I guess I'm going to defend him either way here. If they get better, that's great. We see they're better. But if they don't, everybody can't just fold the tent and say, ah, here we go again. Give the guy a chance to go recruit and develop another couple of classes and then see where it is. And that's when you're going to know. Watson, listen, if it sounds like I'm coming off critical of him. No, no, no. You don't. I, I'm not because he inherited – a joke of a program. I mean, their big claim to fame was putting a girl out there at Missouri to kick a ground ball and she's a hero. I mean, no, really? I, I didn't take it that way at all from you, George. And I've talked yeah. to you off the air about this. We both feel the same way. Uh, I don't know what else he could have done up to this point. He's just got to keep going. And as, and, and as I would tell him, put the blinders on and just keep going. And don't let the ups and downs change your thought process. Just keep keep doing what you're doing and, and don't listen to, to the fans that I love, but they're going to be up and down. That's just the way it is. They're going to be that way. Or and that's no disrespect. That's passion within the program. Yeah. I mean, listen to Tony for Tennessee when he comes on with us. There's passion in his voice, and he goes up and down a little, even though he understands more. But that's, that's the part coaches can't get into, and I'm, I think sometimes we do. We get into what the fans feel, 
And, and, and that's a bad trait when you go there. And I learned that some, some ways, sometimes the hard ways. So you start listening or trying to please the fans. Then you start getting out of your true philosophy of what you're trying to do, George. And so far, I, I don't think Clark has done that. But now he's got seven, eight, let's see, seven more SEC ball games to play. And I keep saying, it ain't the Ole Miss. It's Ole Miss. Then it's Georgia. Then it's South Carolina. Then on it's and on and on. That's what you've got yeah. to find a way to get through. It's not just Ole Miss Saturday. You okay. and I had a long conversation the other day about we beat Florida. Then we come back home for Ole Miss when I was at – and in, in my middle, middle late, I guess, time at Vanderbilt, and doggone, we got Ole Miss beat. And we kind of let them get an onside kick. They score late and beat us. That's the grind right there. It's the grind that he's got to just keep fighting through. Okay, I want to ask this, and give me about a minute on this. You're the perfect person to ask. You've sat in that chair. There are a lot of smart football coaches that have not won big at Vandy. They didn't all just get, you all didn't just get stupid uh, when you came here. But there is a point where a coach looks and says, I am beating my head against a wall. I've had enough of this fight. What, what kind of advice would you give him as he goes through this? Put the blinders on and keep doing what you believe in. And if you see what you're trying to do isn't working, then be, be willing to change to figure something out. George, I got middle of my way at Vanderbilt, and I knew I couldn't get it done. I knew I couldn't get it done. And I went to my boss, and I said, we got to change some things or this ain't going to work. Well, we got some things changed in year four and year five, and it finally – got going a little bit, but it was too late for me. But I knew after year three, I wasn't getting it done. We weren't bringing in enough really good football players to complete compete in the SEC. And, and I laid that on the line to my boss, laid it flat out there, and, and uh, ended up not making it. But we did finally get some of the things that I wanted done, meaning got my Guggen built, got – got better players, and I'm not going to go into how, but got better players into the program in those last two years. And uh, Clark's just – he'll know. I'm telling you, he'll know if he's getting it done or not. And uh, I did, and I think he will too. Okay, we'll go to the break. Good discussion that we've just had here. We'll go stat of the day. That's next. And then we'll go down to Baton Rouge, Mike Moscona, from ESPN Radio in Baton Rouge, who is really wired to that LSU program. He will join us, so we've got plenty coming and maybe a little boasting about my baseball team. I'm pretty happy. This is Main Street Media Television. Serving Williamson and surrounding counties, Bone and Joint Institute of Tennessee offers comprehensive orthopedic care. With 16 subspecialized physicians, our practice provides high-tech care with a hometown touch. We offer physician clinics, physical and occupational therapy, advanced imaging, and surgical services, including interventional procedures. Call us at 615-791-2630. We're Bone and Joint Institute of Tennessee. High-tech care with a hometown touch. The high school football season is here, and nobody handles Friday nights better than Main Street Media. Here's Zach Womble with details. That's the name of the game here at Main Street Media and Main Street Preps. Is, you know, we've been doing this for a long time now, and, and I think you hit on it. We've got an army of reporters across all of Middle Tennessee. I think there's about 130 schools uh, in the Middle Tennessee area, and we cover we try to cover all of them. We cover about 11, 12 counties at this point. And uh, yeah, those those Friday night shows, it's you know, we're gonna we're gonna show we're gonna show that off. We're gonna showcase the talent that we have on the field with with reporters across several mid-state games on the weekly basis. So, you know, whether you're in Williamson County, whether you're in 
Giles County or Murray County or Montgomery or Robertson or anywhere in between, we're going to have you covered from 6 to 11. Friday Night Live is presented by the Tennessee Highway Safety Office, where fans don't let fans drive drunk. At Sumner Funeral and Cremation, our mission is to serve families as our own, celebrate the life of their loved one, and help begin the healing process. My whole family, including my wife and my mom and siblings, were very happy with the treatment that we received. I would highly recommend Sumner Funeral and Cremation. We offer funeral, burial, cremations, and pre-planning services. Sumner Funeral and Cremation. Traditional. Affordable. Dignified. SumnerFuneral.com. Welcome to the Omni Nashville Hotel. Urban elegance with a vintage touch. Our 800 room hotel opened up in the fall of 2013 with 746 guest rooms and 54 suites. Hey everyone, I'm John English. This is Keith Wallace and we would like to welcome you to John English Antique Sports and Cards in Shelbyville, Tennessee. We specialize in graded and ungraded sports and non-sports cards, vintage wax boxes and unopened cases. We have a large selection of PSA graded cards. We also specialize in old sports collectibles, baseball, football, basketball, golf, and tennis. You can find it all at John English Antique Sports and Cards. We are happy to be associated with Nashville's greatest sports antique, George Plaster. It is now time for Stat of the Day, powered by John English Antique Sports and Cards in Shelbyville, as well as Eric Berner with Rockcastle Wealth Advisors. John English, they specialize in antique and historical sports equipment, advertising, and other sport-related items. You can find them Tuesdays through Fridays from noon to 5 o'clock and Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 5. Visit them online at johnenglishgradedcards.com. Also, Eric Berner with Rockcastle Wealth Advisors. Call Eric at 615 490 7052 or visit them online at rockcastlewealth.com for more information. We roll now into today's stat of the day. And we add this in right here just like that. Which NFL wide receiver has the all-time record for the most receptions in a single season? And a little hint, he is a current receiver. Thought that was interesting. Watson Norman Jordan never play in the NFL. <laughs> I hope he's listening. <laughs> oh, no, no, he never made it. That's, um, but uh, boy, he and we, Alma Matthews, Alma did. Alma did. He played with the Falcons for quite, for, quite some time. So. so we pulled one out of our rear end yesterday. Um, yeah. And I don't think we're going to do that again here. But. Let's think through some guys that that catch a lot of footballs um, for the most receptions in a single season. A Cooper Cup had well over a hundred a year ago, but in a seventeen game season, it doesn't mean what it used to. It means six a game, not that that's chopped liver. I don't think it's Cooper Cup, but help me. Any names coming to you at all? No, well, that's the first one I had. I'd say uh, is was Diggs one of those up there that caught a bunch? You might be right about that. Stefan Diggs in Buffalo had a big season. I don't know why. I don't think it's either one of them, but I can't come with a better name right now 
than what you're giving me. Um, wide receiver has the all-time record for most receptions in a single season. Well, let's let's think about who the receivers might be. Who, who's on who by teams? Who's the better passing teams? Let's name those real quick. Kansas City. Kansas City. Derek Hill. He's the only one that would have him or the but tight end. That he went deep so often that yeah. would reduce. What about the, the tight end? No, I don't think a tight end would be all time reception. Leader. Well, okay, but tight end says here current wide receiver. Yeah, so that's not him. Okay, um, Buffalo. We've named the best one on that bunch. Um, that's the two best passing teams in the AFC. Who's the NFC? Has been the best passing teams. Well, Green Bay, but there hasn't a uh, Devontae Adams. Devontae Adams would be a thought now. You want to go uh, with him? Devontae Adams. Um, the Saints were real strong passing. Michael team. Thomas. Michael would Thomas. Uh, Brady and Brady and Manning, those guys are gone. All of them. Yep. They're gone. So that it's got to be one of those. We've not, I promise you, we've named him. You think you think one of our three is it? I think it's 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 Diggs, it's Cup, it's Thomas, or it's uh Devontae. It's one of those four. I don't have a clue. Let, let's see what bet it you is. it's one of the four. Yeah, let's see. Michael Thomas. Oh my goodness, really? Yeah. And this season, Cooper Cup is on pace for 179, so he could overtake that. So there you, you go. We did pretty good with that, George. Wow, we didn't do bad. You even mentioned a guy that potentially could, could. take over that spot. Okay, I feel good about that. Now, no. you know, I wouldn't I, have known which one of the four to pick, but I thought we it had to be one of those guys. Am I patting myself on the back? Am I? Well, you of know, course, you're real good at you're, that. You're your own biggest fan, George. You're 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 real good at patting yourself on the back, babe. That has <laughs> never been one of your issues. <laughs> well, it's like Tony Basilio. Nice to have you on the show as well. It's like <laughs> it's like Tony said about Brian Kelly yesterday. He's his own biggest fan. Oh man, <laughs> don't, don't you have something to read over there? Yes, I do. If George. not, just go home. <laughs> It is time for the 5 o'clock hour here, the George Plaster Show, brought to you by Middle Tennessee Bone & Joint. They combine state-of-the-art orthopedic service with a family atmosphere, whether it's a sports injury, a sprained ankle, or a major joint replacement. MTBJ has the staff, training, and equipment needed to take care of any patient in any circumstance. Visit them on the web at mtbj.net for more information. Okay, all of you know by now, Tennessee's about a field goal favorite Saturday down in Baton Rouge against LSU. Matt Moscona from ESPN Radio in Baton Rouge is about to join us. He is as wired to that program as anybody in that media down there. We begin with a topic that all of us have had some fun with, an 11 a.m. kickoff. I want to ask about the second half of the Mississippi State game where from Nashville, you know how big a game this is for both teams. There's this belief up here, and I'll admit I buy into it some because I've done a couple of games at Tiger Stadium back in my Vanderbilt play-by-play -play days that you get a big advantage if you don't have to play LSU at night. But you've been around Tiger Stadium a lot more than I have. Do you buy that? Well, the numbers don't exactly bear it out. Um, LSU has actually, uh, there's basically an indiscriminate winning percentage when it comes to daytime games or nighttime games. Um, and there could be a lot of different reasons, but the undeniable truth, George, is that when LSU plays at night and especially in this day and age where let's be honest, nobody fills hundred thousand seat stadiums anymore. You may sell every ticket, but it, it's a, it's a rare occurrence. I think you would agree. Uh, I mean, Tennessee against Florida a couple of weeks ago was an awesome environment. Those are still one-offs. You know, it's rare that you fill a stadium and have it full throat fever pitch for all the reasons people know. Uh, home view, viewing experience is too good. Uh, traffic, parking, cost, all that stuff. Um, this game with Tennessee had the potential to be one of those, those really special nights in Tiger Stadium. 
Um, I think it's going to be a great crowd. Uh, the game is sold out, and and I think people will be as ready to go at 11 a.m. as they can be. Um, and I have seen some great environments during the day in Tiger Stadium. I would argue, you know, one of the top environments I've ever seen was when LSU played Georgia in 2003. Georgia was in the top 10, and LSU went on to win a national championship that year. That was a day game, and it was as good an environment as I've ever seen. So, um, long way of answering your question. I absolutely believe that playing the game at night would be a bigger advantage for LSU, no question. But I don't think that um, LSU is allergic to winning in the daytime either. Uh, I'm going to get asked this at some point. I don't really know the answer. Does LSU try to say to the league office, look, this is a special deal. Alabama doesn't care whether they play in the daytime or night, but Tiger Stadium at night is a totally different deal. Do they petition the league on that? Yes, absolutely. That's a conversation that's always had, that um, the league and the TV partners do work together uh, preferentially to give LSU night games at home. Now, one thing I do know, George, is that CBS has told LSU and the league they want to be in Tiger Stadium at least once a year. And when LSU and Bama were the 7 p.m. game, every other year that wasn't a problem. But you're going to play those those 2.30 afternoon CBS games for sure. But it's a, it's rare, man. It is really rare that LSU play an 11 a.m. game, and especially one of this magnitude, George. I mean, listen, I normally when LSU plays 11 a.m. games, it's – it's a bad Mississippi State team coming in. You know, they played 11 a.m. against Kentucky in, in 2011. Um, they actually oddly did play an 11 a.m. game last year in Tiger Stadium against Florida, and, and LSU ran for a school record in that game and, and, and won as a double-digit underdog. Um, but, but to, yes, yes, they, they do talk to the league office and the TV partners about playing night games. Okay, let's get to the field. Uh, the record is good. Uh, it seems like everybody is upbeat about what Brian Kelly is trying to do. It does seem like there's little inconsistencies offensively. Talk to me about where you think they are right now as a program. Well, as a program, they're they're building. And I think if you hey, – George, I think you and I probably talked about this in the summer when we spoke, but – you know, this season, I think, for LSU is is less about the win-loss record and more about Brian Kelly establishing a foundation and a culture and having buy-in. Look, I'll yep. give you an example. LSU, in their three Power 5 opponents they've played so far, Florida State, Mississippi State, and Auburn, they've been now double digits to all three. And in all three, they rallied. And they were a block PAT away from maybe pulling off the Florida State game, and they did beat Mississippi State and Auburn. They, they have buy-in right now, which they didn't have a year ago. When LSU got down to Ole Miss, when they got down to Kentucky a year ago, they quit flat. They quit on Edozeron. So that's one big part of progress. Now, the shortcomings on the field, I mean, you don't have to look far to see them. I mean, you see what they are. They threw for 85 yards against Auburn. Um, They have, despite having a guy like Kayshawn Booty, who's some think the best receiver in college football, He's got no touchdowns and fewer than 100 yards receiving through five games. There's not a soul alive that would have thought that coming into this year. They've got to figure out how to establish a vertical passing game. Uh, the offensive line is starting two true freshmen uh, at, at your tackle spots. So there's a lot of growing pains there. Um, it, it, special teams have been an issue this year. I mean, they've the, the on-field shortcomings are very obvious for all to see. Um, the big question, I think, for LSU is how how much can they continue to improve as the season gets along to maybe be able to, to compete with the better teams in the league? Let's go with Booty. You brought him up. Great receiver, not getting the ball enough, doesn't seem very happy about it. How much friction is there, whether it's with him and Brian Kelly or him and a quarterback? Yeah, I, I think from the outside looking in, this is hard to believe, but I think Keishon Booty really is in a good spot. And I'm telling you from – yeah, I asked Brian Kelly that question point blank on Monday. It was the first press of his, question of his press conference. I set it up just like I, I told you. No touchdowns, fewer than 100 yards. Why aren't you getting him more involved? And Brian Kelly was quick to point out, you look at the film, Kayshawn is running full speed in his routes. He's given great effort. The ball's just not coming to him. And you know, one of the things that, that Brian Kelly did stress this week is Jaden Daniels, um, interestingly enough, is one of only a handful of quarterbacks in college football with more than 100 pass attempts 
that has not thrown an interception. Hendon Hooker is one of them also. But Brian Kelly said, listen, if I, I don't want to throw interceptions, but you got to be able to toe that line between aggressive and, and reckless. And we want you to be aggressive. And I think that's the thing right now is LSU is just not pushing the ball down the field. So the targets just aren't there for, for Kayshawn Booty right now. But then I think the onus is on the, the coaching staff to, to get creative, to find ways to get them the football, um, which I, I would imagine you'll see this weekend. You need to, you know, to be a competitive against a, an offense like Tennessee where LSU is going to have to score. But I, I really do believe, George, and I don't think this is lip service because I've asked enough people around the program that Kayshawn's in a good spot. I mean, he's he it took some buy-in on his part when Brian Kelly first was hired, but I, I believe he's there, and I believe he's excited to be on a winning team and, and understands that, that his time's going to come at some point this year. I believe LSU went to a level that I didn't know they had. Talk to me about that, because it was impressive. I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about defensively. Uh, yes. Because, well, and, you know, coming out of fall camp, I would tell you uh, maybe the biggest surprise, uh, and we got to see a lot of fall camp. I mean, they let us watch full-scale scrimmages in fall camp, which we've, we've got to watch a few full practices, which we've never gotten to do as long as I've been covering LSU. Um, I would tell you the, the biggest surprise was I thought the defense was better than I thought they were going to be. And I think Matt House has a – the defense coordinator – has a history of being a really good defense coordinator in the SEC. He was at Kentucky under Mark Stoops when they had uh, Josh Allen that year when Allen had 21 sacks and was just a freak show. Um, Madhouse has really figured out uh, where to put the pieces on the chessboard with this defense. And I think, oddly enough, the way they've recruited, uh, the talent on the roster actually fits what he wants to do pretty well. And the more comfortable they get, the more you're seeing the results. I mean, look, they shut out Auburn on the road in the second half. They shut out Mississippi State in the second half. Um, they obviously held Florida State down in the fourth quarter and allowed the offense to get back in it. So LSU's defense is unquestionably a strong suit, and, and they are getting better and better each week. And that's going to be their recipe to win a lot of these games, George. It's going to be the defense has got to play really good, and the offense is going to have to be opportunistic. Is their biggest fear Saturday that they get into one of these things where defensively they're out there for 90 plays because Tennessee just keeps doing and doing and doing? And you know where I'm going with that. Isn't that everybody's fear against Tennessee? Yeah, well, I think it is. <laughs> I mean, they're they're the fastest team in college football. I yeah. mean, that's what Josh Heupel wants to do. Um, you know, we've seen uh, forms of that offense in the league with Kendall Bryles, with um, – with Jeff Levy when he was there with Kiffin. Um, but, man, Heupel just undeniably has it going at a, at a different speed right now. And it's uh, outside looking in. It's fun to watch. I don't know that it's fun for a defense coordinator to prepare for. But, but yeah, I mean, shortly to answer your question, of course that's the fear, is that you have to play – you get into the game that Florida did, where you're playing a keep-up. And, and that's not going to go well for really anybody. Um, I think – the roadmap to beating Tennessee is more what Pitt did and play a game in the thirties, probably the low thirties where, you know, you assume in a given game that a team has usually on average 12 possessions. And if you have 12 possessions, can you get off the field six times? And if in the six scoring drives, can you hold them to three field goals? And if you can, you play good red zone defense and, and hold them to threes instead of sixes. Now easier said than done, but, but that's, that's the roadmap, right? Cause if, Three touchdowns, three field goals, that's 30 points. So if you give up 30, can you score 31? We all know Tennessee's past defenses really struggled this year. I mean, they're one of the worst statistically in the country. So that's that is that is the roadmap. I mean, holding the threes instead of sixes and, and score when you have the opportunity. I mean, that if if teams end up beating Tennessee this year, that's how it's gonna have to happen. Hey, before I let you go, what happened at the beginning of the game looked awful. Tell us what you know about that young man and what what is the what's the prognosis here, short term, long term. Yeah, so that was uh that was Seven Banks. Um yeah. is a cornerback who's a transfer from Ohio State. And George, it's, so the, well let me the good news is that he's okay. Um he Great. They, he was taken to the hospital. Um 
when he w- he was unconscious on the field and had lost feeling temporarily. And um, by the time he got to the hospital, he'd regained feeling, was conscious, was walking around. He actually returned to Jordan-Hare Stadium and watched the rest of the game from the locker room. Uh, they're um, describing it as a as a spinal bruise. So nothing structurally damaged. All, all that is fantastic news. Um, so uh, his situation is... Um, it's it, man, it's it's kind of a bummer. I mean, look, that was obviously a very serious situation. I'm just talking about from a football standpoint. Yeah. He tra- he was injured at Ohio State. He transferred. He played a bunch, but was a little injury prone. Transferred to LSU. Didn't re- didn't see the field until last week against New Mexico when he was finally cleared. Played last week, and then of course the Auburn game comes and on the opening kickoff. He's injured. It looks like he's going to miss maybe a month or so. Um, so it's just. Man, it's an unfortunate situation for that young guy who's uh, really struggled to stay healthy and stay on the field. But but most importantly, obviously, is that he's he is OK from what was a, a very scary situation there at the opening kickoff against Auburn. Watson, you think Tennessee's going to win this game, don't you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, I think it'll tell be me, tell me why. Than, well, I just don't think LSU can outscore them. I don't think LSU can score in the 30s, um, and I and I think the game will go as it goes in this hot during the day in Baton Rouge at 11 o'clock. It's hot, and uh, I just think they'll wear down. I think Tennessee will wear them down, and Tennessee will win the game. I'm not saying it's going to be a blowout. I don't feel that way, but I just don't see. I don't see a scenario where LSU can win the game, George. They're just not good enough on offense. Yeah. Interesting. Um, Let's do this, Watson. We'll go to the break, and then we'll check in on what is today, the final day of the Major League Baseball regular season, but really inconsequential, try saying that a few times, because the pairings are now set. Once Atlanta clinched last night, it's all done. We'll show you what is what and give you some opinions when we come back. This is Main Street Media Television. Buying or selling a home can be a very personal experience. Why not go with the team that receives nearly all of their business from referrals? Clearly a trusted name in real estate. The Justin Tucker team with Platinum Realty Partners has sold more than 500 homes in the last seven years. Voted best in Sumner County multiple times. Proven to be trusted with your most personal assets. Call the Justin Tucker team with Platinum Realty Partners at 615-906-8458. The Justin Tucker team with Platinum Realty Partners. Middle Tennessee's most trusted team in realty. I highly recommend Sumner Funeral and Cremation because of their caring nature and attentiveness to detail. Pre-planning your funeral now will bring you peace of mind and less stress to your loved ones. When the chaos of losing you happens, your family can honor and celebrate your life, knowing things are happening just as you wanted them to. Pre-planning determines the details of your funeral, cemetery services, and can be less expensive. We are honored to serve you and are always here for you in your time of need. Sumner Funeral and Cremation. Traditional. Affordable. Dignified. SumnerFuneral.com Jody Jones Dentistry can handle all your dental needs from the basics to cosmetic procedures. All of this in the nicest dental facility I have ever seen. Jody has done it right. They're located conveniently at 55 Music Square East and for an appointment, it's simple. Dial 615-259-5100 and tell them Plaz sent you. When you're thinking about golf, consider Riverside Golf Links. Under new ownership, the course has improved dramatically. It's now 27 holes, complemented by a nine-hole executive course. Book a tee time now at 615-847-5074 and get ready to enjoy the beauty of golf in the Old Hickory area at Riverside Golf Links. I'm Bart Durham. I was sworn in as a lawyer in 1963, and I've been working as a lawyer since then. 
We're a firm that does exclusively personal injury, a lot of tractor trailer crashes. Insurance companies will open up their checkbooks when you force them to. We have systems that work. We get the most money for our clients in the shortest amount of time. I'm Blair Durham. My dad and I want to help. Give us a call at 615-242-9000. This is Eric Berner with Rock Hassle Wealth Advisors. I help people in the pursuit of making their money live as long as they do. People hire me because I use a customized, individualized, and personal approach for the person I'm working with. Everyone's situation is different. If you've lost a spouse or a parent and want to make sure your inheritance is utilized and does not just disappear, I can help with that. Call me at 615-235-1058 or email eric at rockcastlewealth.com. Well, as all of you know, there are at least two things in life that are certainties. Watson, I believe there is a third. I'd like you to name the three, if you would. Death taxes and Braves win pennant races, right? Uh, that's not where I was going. Where are you going? What? You're absolutely right. So, big check mark to you. Death taxes and the networks will put either the Mets or the Yankees in prime time. If you're looking for Atlanta to be prime time, it ain't happening. No, no, we know that that's not happening. So let's, let's look at where all of this is right now. And, um, Watson, let's start in the left-hand corner where Cleveland is a three seed in the American league will take on Tampa Bay. And the truth of the matter is that Cleveland is a big surprise. Terry Francona has done one of his best managing jobs to get them there. Yeah, absolutely. And that's not an easy route right there to me for the Yanks. Either one of those two teams can give the Yankees trouble that wins that in my opinion. So that's not a great draw. To me, it's not anyway. The other one is this surging Seattle Mariners team, which a lot of the country doesn't see. They play late night. I see them a lot. They're an exciting team against an offensive juggernaut in Toronto. Uh, I think Toronto wins the series, but don't be surprised when in the next year or two, this Seattle bunch starts to make some noise. No, they're they're fun to watch too, aren't they? I mean, they got some really good young players. Uh, if if it falls like I think, it'll be the Yankees and the Astros, and the Yankees for some reason can't beat the Astros. They can't beat them. So I I know Terry's cringing if he's listening to us, but I'd still pick the Astros right now. Well, there'll be a lot of trash can banging. There oh, are a lot of break. bitter feelings in the Yankee clubhouse, they feel like, and I, as much as I hate the Yankees, I can't argue this point. They got screwed out of a world title in 2017 by not getting by the Astros. Uh, That's who five years them. ago, for God's sakes. They got to figure yeah, out how to beat the Astros. But Period. the problem is, Watson, there's still a lot of that core in Houston still there. Yeah, they're not cheating now. They're still beating the Yankees. <laughs> so, I mean... Till, till the Yankees beat the Astros, whether they cheated or not, till they beat them. I'm telling you, when you ain't beat somebody in a while, it just ain't easy to click your fingers and start beating them. So I'm not sure I wouldn't pick the Astros. And the Astros would have the extra home game, correct? Yes. So I think it'll be Yankees and Astros, and I'm picking the Astros to beat the Yankees. Is this one of the better baseball runs? I know, yeah, they, they cheated. But to sustain it, even these last couple of years, it's pretty incredible. Yeah, it's well, it's it's gone kind of quiet and unnoticed a little bit because because of exactly what we just put out there. When that if that series were to happen, Yankees and Astros, 
the the storyline is not going to be about the consistency of the Astros over a five six year period. It's going to be they cheated, right? They cheated, and here was the fallout. AJ Hinch got fired. Lunal, the GM, got fired. Um, the owner. A lot of people think he knew. So Watson, you know as well as I do, if they play again, that's the storyline. And if the Yankees let that be the storyline, they're going to lose again. You, the Yankees need to let that go. The fans and the media can go with it all they want, but the Yankees need to beat this Astro team and quit worrying about 2017. And if they keep doing that, they'll lose to them again because the Astros are pretty daggum good. They are very good. Yep. Now let's go to the National League. And let's start at the bot. First of all, the series in the corners, Tampa Bay, Cleveland, Seattle, Toronto, the Phillies, St. Louis, San Diego, the Mets. Those are all three game series where all of the all of the home games are with the better seated team. Cleveland will have three home games against Tampa. Big advantage. Huge advantage. Toronto will have three at home against Seattle. St. Louis will have three at home against Philly. And that Cardinal bunch, they love their baseball. That'll be a very difficult environment for the Phillies. The Mets will have three at home against San Diego. Watson, I fully believe the Mets are going to win that series against the Padres. I want them to win it. Because I think they can, again, do the Braves a real favor. I think the Mets can go toe-to-toe with the Dodgers, and I think they can win that series. Yeah, but I, I think the Braves, of the four that are on the right, I would rather play anybody. Oh, I'd rather play anybody but the Cardinals. Yeah, we, the Braves can beat the Mets. We've proven it. We can beat San Diego. We wore the Phillies out. And the Cardinals is the one team I wouldn't want to play that we're going to catch. So I'm a little concerned about that series, to be very honest. Okay. Well, uh, ho- hold on on that. We'll, we'll get to that. Boy, you jumped. You just I'm blew sorry. right past where I was going. Well, take me backwards. Okay. I'm going to. I'm good at going backwards. <laughs> Second and 13. <laughs> Backs are in the eye. Yeah. Do you believe the Mets are good enough to beat the Dodgers in a short series? In a short series, yes. In a four because it would seven. be a five-game series. Yeah, they can because of their pitching. They can beat anybody in a short series. But the way they performed against the Braves, I don't know, man. I, 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 I'm very disappointed in the Mets, even though I was for the Braves' heart. But that was that was embarrassing to me. All you got to do is go in there and win one game, and you're probably going to win it. And you can't win one game with your three best pitchers going. So I don't, I don't think they'll beat the, I don't think they'll beat the Dodgers. That's just personal. Here is Billy. One of the things that I wonder about with the Mets, it's a great pitching staff. I mean, when you can load up Scherzer, Jacob Degrom, Carlos Carrasco. Taiwan Walker, Chris Bassett. Not that they'll use all five in any of these series, but that's a dead gum good rotation. My worry is that DeGrom is not 100%. Second time in his career, he gave up three bombs in Atlanta. Only one other time in his career has he ever done that. Right now, he's too hittable. The Mets need the Jacob DeGrom, who's a stud. Just like the Dodgers need uh, Clayton Kershaw, the stud. It's it's all about pitching. I mean, and the Mets have it, but the one player they need, the one pitcher that has to perform for them is Jacob DeGrom. And, and if he pitches the way he did against the Braves, I'm with Watson. The Mets, they may lose to the Padres. I mean, the the, the Padres at the plate have been phenomenal too, so – I think this is one of the more wild. We could see some wild things, and in, in, especially in that NL side, George. Yeah. I think with the Mets and Padres, not saying it's a toss-up. The Mets should win, but I wouldn't be surprised if the Padres come out. Right. And, you know, the way the Phillies are playing, it, we've seen what a hot team coming into the playoffs can do as well. I, I would expect uh, the, the wildest 
especially in that NL side. So Cardinals, Phillies, all of those games are in St. Louis. And as Watson mentioned, St. Louis has had some past history where they've really had some success and gotten under Atlanta's skin. Watson, I think one of the things the Braves needed, and and what they've done is incredible. I mean, it took 101 victories to get them a division title. That's how good the Mets were. Yeah. They pushed Atlanta absolutely to the brink. So how you put a playoff roster together is really interesting. For instance, I want no part of Jake Odorizzi on that roster. Although he pitched halfway decent last night, this is a trade acquisition that's been a dud. He just hadn't given them what they really needed. And the Braves are teetering right now on Spencer Strider, who might be the National League Rookie of the Year, and anybody who saw him, they know how electric he is. This guy is 99 on the radar gun in the first inning, and he's 99 at the end. He's electric, but he's got an oblique. And Watson, I'm hearing them kind of hedge their bets. And I'm wondering if they're really what they're trying to do is say, okay, can we keep him out of a St. Louis Philly series and win it and then bring him up when we play the Dodgers? Well, I don't, I'm not sure he'll be ready but till the Dodgers. That's a pretty good injury, George, and it's it doesn't heal overnight. And it's been a little bit, but personally, if the, the top three pitchers for the Braves that'll be fresh, uh, you won't have to use Strider. Your pitching should be fine. But uh they need they can't win the four out of seven against LA without him, in my personal opinion. Two, two Three out of five, yes. Four out of seven, two out of three. But four out of seven, they've got to get him back. That team at the bottom is the Godzilla, the Dodgers. So what is it I've talked myself into that gets the Dodgers out of this picture and gets Atlanta back to a World Series, which is obviously what I want? I am trying to make myself believe that if the Dodgers have to play both the Mets and the Braves, they're not going to be able to beat both of them. That is a real gauntlet to go through those two. Now, I hear what you're saying, Watson, that St. Louis can be a problem, and they certainly could be. But if you avoid playing both the Mets and the Dodgers, advantage Atlanta Braves being the two seed looks to me to be easier yeah. than being the one seed. I agree. I could you imagine though if the Mets make it through a Braves Mets NLCS? That would be unbelievable. That and city would go crazy. Berserk and they have the higher seed too so they had they'd have home field the Braves they that win last night was maybe the biggest win in the past few years for the Braves because they they just secured the advantage of the top half of that NL bracket, I think. I agree with you, George. Yeah. Watson, got any thoughts there? I think two is easier than one. Uh, I'm not big on the Mets right now. Sorry. They did not play well down the stretch. You're just a big old wet blanket, aren't you? <laughs> well, I'm just being honest. I, I was not impressed with the Mets. You can't go in and win one game in Atlanta. Yeah. And, and to let Atlanta catch up, they did not play well, guys, down the stretch. They won a lot of games late in games. I, was, I can remember a game where we were down four to nothing in the seventh inning. They came back and won. They have not played near as consistent a baseball as the Dodgers, the Braves have played. And I might even throw the Cardinals in there. They I have heard, not. So I'm not as big on the Mets as you guys are. I've heard some rumors. I, I've heard some rumors the past couple of days about Buck Showalter throughout his career not being able to close out seasons and not, you know, he has had great teams, but they haven't closed well. Is that true? I mean, well, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know don't, enough about his career, but I think the world of Buck Showalter, I don't, so I'm, I won't go there, but it's just they're not performing. They're, they're just not getting it done. And I think it's been their pitching. Scherzer's been hit lately. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Degrom's been hit lately. They've been not huge. just by the Braves. They both, but they both have not been strong down the stretch at bad times. At bad times. I mean, who was the who they play? The Marlins before they came to Atlanta. They struggled with the Marlins. Uh, barely got out of that thing alive. I think that was the team. They were down four runs in a in the bottom of the seventh against the Marlins and won the game. And uh, so I'm I'm not as big on the Mets. I'm I'm I think it's Atlanta and L.A. and go at it because they're the two best teams on that side. And and that's got to be demoralizing too for the Mets in terms of their mental. I mean, you had a shot; it was right there. That two seed was right there for you, and you now you got the four seed. If you you got to face the the Padres, who aren't aren't easy to face. If you win, you get the Dodgers. If you won, if you won one game in that series, you'd be playing this last game for the division tonight, just to win one. That's what's shocking. Oh. And they couldn't win one game out of the three. And the best pitcher for Atlanta didn't pitch, who I think was the best one throughout the year. I know we say Max Fried, but I think Strider is the best pitcher all year long. Watson, he, who wins it all? Huh? Who wins it all? The winner of the Braves and the Dodgers win it all again. Billy? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I don't – I just don't – that NL just, just looks better. I mean, it just looks better, better teams, more more depth. And, yeah, I, I think – I like the Dodgers, but – and I'm not just saying this. I am a Braves fan, but I there's something, again, in, in, in this picture right now. I'm looking at it. The Braves' path looks looks pretty good. Looks easier. Yeah. And uh, now I could be eating my words here, but I mean, it looks really, really good for the, for the Braves. Not going to say now, easy. I think all of you know where I'm going. And I'll tell you why I'm going there because they have a better bullpen than anybody else. Over the last three, four weeks, their bullpen has been lights out and they've done it with no Luke Jackson this year. A Tyler Matzik who hasn't been anywhere near what he was last season when he was a postseason hero. Kenley Jansen, even though he just makes me crazy at times, has been lights out for about three weeks now. This Racel Iglesias, who was not mm -hmm. all that good with the Angels, has been lights out with the Braves. A.J. Minner has been pretty close to lights out. Bullpens are critical in postseason because you go to them earlier than you do in the regular season. Atlanta's got a better bullpen than anybody else. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. And, and they don't have they don't have Will Smith to worry about. Thank God. <laughs> oh. I know he pitched well at times in the postseason, but oh. more times than not, he gave Braves fans heart attacks. So Watson. You wouldn't really give me a winner. You just sort of. I, I think it's the winner of the Braves and the Dodgers. I'm not, I don't, and I can't pick that one. Why? Is there some <laughs> mental block? I mean, I think, I think you can flip a coin. I think it's, I think the Braves are as good as the Dodgers. A lot of people think the Dodgers are better than everybody. I think the Braves are as good as the Dodgers. There's two things I love about that, though. Jansen now with the Braves and Freeman yeah. now with the oh. Dodgers. Wow, that. will that be fun to watch? What a storyline. What a storyline to switch those two, two very important people. I will say, sides. I will say, Freddie Freeman being on the Dodgers, look out, that could play a factor because Freeman, he knows everything about that Braves organization. And he, so I, I don't know how much of a factor it plays, but just keep an eye on that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he's a winner. He's a winner. He shows up at big times. He did last year. And uh, that's, I just think it's toss up city. And I, I don't, I think it'll be the Astros on the other side because I don't think the Yankees will, can beat them. I just don't think they can. It all starts Friday with these three game series. After the break, plaster bet of the day. But first, we say hello to our buddy Brian Stewart who joins us down at the bottom of the screen somewhere. Brian, how are you? Doing great, George. How are you today? Watson, Good. how are you? Had Good, to Brian. find you there for a second. 
let me let me show off this uh, hat here, you know, because it is officially five back to back NL East championships. I mean, how amazing is that for the Braves? Yeah. It's yeah. just it's incredible. Um, this was the hardest of them. Well, uh, you know, Watson and you guys were talking about it that you know the the Mets struggled against the Marlins, and I mean, you know, Atlanta goes in, sweeps that series, has a tough game, you know, the following night you know, against the Marlins. And then last night was just, it was gut check time. I mean, for them to come out and, you know, just power their way through that game. I mean, it was a two, one game, but I mean, I think just like you were just talking about George, it showed the power and strength of that bullpen, um, you know, just not allowing, you know, they, they let people on base, but they didn't give it up. They've been bent, but didn't break. And, you know, that's what it's going to be all about in the, in the postseason and, you know, I, I think there's some dangerous teams on both sides, but all of the, all through the the year, especially the latter half of the year, the Braves have just shown that they have the strength in the bullpen, they have the depth in the through throughout the roster to hit the ball. Uh, Anthopolis made another fantastic move, bringing in Iglesias from uh, from the Angels. I mean, that that guy right there should be our MVP. That's my personal opinion. Well, um, he's been pretty darn good, and they'll need him in the postseason. Yeah, I so, mean it's you know, and I, that's what I'm saying. Iglesias is is pitching great, but I think Anthopolis should be the MVP. He's, <laughs> I mean, for the second year in a row. Yeah, I mean it's just it's ridiculous what he does at the at the cutoff. Um, but yeah, uh, George, I, I appreciate you guys having me on here today. Uh, wanted to just hit on a, a couple things that we got coming up. Number one, we got the Haunted Hustle coming up. The It's a 5K race that benefits uh, Habitat for Humanity, Sumner County. Uh, it's a fun run. Uh, we have kids. We have uh, we have Big Bird. I mean, we literally have every costume you can think of where people come out and dress and run and walk, and they're pulling kids in wagons. Uh, basically, we don't care how long it takes you to finish this race. Uh, this is just a fun run. And it's supporting a great cause in Habitat for Humanity, putting people that are in need into a beautiful home at a at a low payment on their mortgage. So I'm, I'm really hoping that we get a good turnout this year. We had 170 runners last year, looking to have 200 plus runners this year. Uh, so if any of you athletes out there that are listening to this show uh, want to come out and benefit a great cause, and I, I loosely use the term athlete because – uh, Brian here will not be running as well. All my running days were in the Marine Corps. So, well, ho hold on a second, Brian. Let me ask one thing. Sure. If if somebody hears this today, just simply show up Saturday. Uh, the race is on October 29th. Ah, uh, okay. It is at the streets of Indian Lake. Uh, we have runsignup.com is who we have our race posted through. So literally all you have to do is haunt, uh, uh, Google Haunted Hustle 5K in Hendersonville or Sumner County, and it'll pull it up. You can also find it on our Facebook page at One Stop Realty TN. Uh, we have it there. We have it on our Instagram, and it's at SumnerRealtors.com as well. Uh, it's a $35 race fee, so it's a minimal fee to come out and, and enter the race. You get a T-shirt with all the logos of the sponsors on the back. A really cool design for the Haunted Hustle on the front. It's a long sleeve cotton T-shirt. Very comfortable T-shirt to wear. Uh, you get a grab bag full of all kinds of goodies from the 30 different sponsors that we have. Uh, and you also get a participation medal as well. Uh, so it's well worth the $35 entry fee to come out, support Habitat, have a great morning, and uh, just fellowship with everybody that morning. Beautiful. You got it all in, didn't you? I tried, George. I'm sorry if I ran over. I don't want to interrupt oh, the bed yeah. of the day here now. No, <laughs> oh, God knows we don't need to. We don't need to disturb the losing trend. Uh, <laughs> Brian, you have a good one. George, thank you, man. And uh, yeah, let's uh, let's get rested up for the uh, the first series coming up next week. Okay. Amen. All Amen. right, y'all have a good night. Okay, plaster bed of the day has to involve SMU Central Florida. Because it's the only game out there. You got to do it. Got no choice. I've got a strong opinion. I'll give it to you next on Main Street Media Television.
Serving Williamson and surrounding counties, Bone and Joint Institute of Tennessee offers comprehensive orthopedic care with 16 subspecialized physicians. Our practice provides high-tech care with a hometown touch. We offer physician clinics, physical and occupational therapy, advanced imaging, and surgical services, including interventional procedures. Call us at 615-791-2630. We're Bone and Joint Institute of Tennessee. High-tech care with a hometown touch. This is attorney Bart Durham, and this is me. I'm Aaliyah. Keeping in good physical condition is really important to me. But when I had a wreck with a tractor trailer truck that hurt my legs so bad, I couldn't work for almost a year. I knew I needed a lawyer that understood tractor trailer cases. So I called Bart. Bart gets millions of dollars for his clients every year. At Bart Durham Injury Law, we've handled hundreds of tractor trailer cases. My dad and I want to help. Give us a call at 615-242-9000. The high school football season is here, and nobody handles Friday nights better than Main Street Media. Here's Zach Womble with details. That's the name of the game here at Main Street Media and Main Street Preps. Is, you know, we've been doing this for a long time now, and I think you hit on it. We've got an army of reporters across all of Middle Tennessee. I think there's about 130 schools in the Middle Tennessee area, and we cover we try to cover all of them. We cover about 11, 12 counties at this point. And uh, yeah, those those Friday night shows, it's you know we're gonna we're gonna show we're gonna show that off. We're gonna showcase the talent that we have on the field with with reporters across several mid state games on the weekly basis. So you know whether you're in Williamson County, whether you're in Giles County or Murray County or Montgomery or Robertson or anywhere in between, we're gonna have you covered from six to eleven. Friday Night Live is presented by the Tennessee Highway Safety Office where fans don't let fans drive drunk. Welcome to the Omni Nashville Hotel. Urban elegance with a vintage touch. Our 800-room hotel opened up in the fall of 2013 with 746 guest rooms and 54 suites. Hey everyone, I'm John English. This is Keith Wallace, and we would like to welcome you to John English Antique Sports and Cards in Shelbyville, Tennessee. We specialize in graded and ungraded sports and non-sports cards, vintage wax boxes, and unopened cases. We have a large selection of PSA graded cards. We also specialize in old sports collectibles, baseball, football, basketball, golf, and tennis. You can find it all at John English Antique Sports and Cards. We are happy to be associated with Nashville's greatest sports antique, George Plaster. Welcome back into the George Plaster Show. It is now time for Plaster's Bet of the Day. We've got college football tonight. I wonder where he's going. Bar Durham Injury Law is the sponsor. They have aggressively protected the rights of a broad range of victims of car accidents and personal injury in both Tennessee and Kentucky. If you, too, have seen your life interrupted by an injury on a highway, in a hospital, or at your workplace, let their attorneys do the work fighting for the full financial compensation that you need. Learn more about Bart Durham Injury Law by logging on to bartdurham.com. All right, let's take a look at some of the results from last night, George. Let's go. No, we, we have to. We got to do it. The let's Dodgers, go. The Dodgers took the loss last night. I was shocked. They took the gas. They, I mean, they just, they took their foot off the gas. Yeah. So the Dodgers take the loss. George. Falls to 41 and 46. Can you believe we've already had that many bets of the day? It's amazing. Watson, we need a win tonight. Yeah, yeah. I believe you could have been saying that for a while. Yeah, thank you. (laughs) It's always good to get your positive reinforcement. (laughs) (laughs) Here's where George is going. He's going with the Knights. 
Okay, and I want to explain this a little bit because I want Watson to either I agree or I don't agree. I want him to to have an opinion. He waffled on that Dodger Brave thing <laughs> like crazy. I want to see if he's if he can take a stand on something. You ready, Watson? Yeah, buddy. <laughs> okay. Central Florida has a history of being really good at home. That's a check mark in their favor tonight. The problem is SMU's really good. So how am I going to make this work? In my mind, it's that John Rice Plumley, the former Ole Miss Rebel quarterback, has got to step up his game. When I saw him against Louisville, he wasn't very good. And if he plays like that tonight, I'll be, what's that record again? 41 and 47. Yeah, whatever. No, that's not it. Put the record back up. 41 46. Yeah, that's. So you would have a loss making you 41 and 47. No, hold on. Put it back up there. Put it back up there. For <laughs> Why are you not believing uh, okay. me? Yeah, that doesn't look good. Watson, he's got to play tonight. He's got to be good or I'm going down. <laughs> so you're betting on John Rice Plumley. Well, yeah. That's basically what you're doing. You're saying Absolutely. If he's good, I win. If he's bad, I lose. And by golly, I'm with him. It means I'm you're, with him, win or tie. That means you're also <laughs> betting against Sonny Dykes. Yeah, look, SMU's pretty good. I mean, Central Florida isn't going to win this game 10-7. to 7. They're going to have to score some points. Isn't Sonny Dykes at SMU? No, he left to go to TCU. He was the one. Oh, that I'm an idiot. Won. Brett Lashley is the coach. Lashley. Well, I, I knew Watson would correct me on that. Yeah. He can't say that, Watson. Yeah, he can. He's got to know who the coach is. Oh, no, he can say that. I mean, I've <laughs> got to know all those things before I present, you know. Did you know? Did you like know that? Bothers you? Just, I just gave you Brett Lashley. He's the head coach. <laughs> Why didn't you correct me before Watson then? <laughs> I was paying no attention to you. <laughs> <laughs> Take that one, George. <laughs> yeah. Both of you can go <laughs> stick it. <laughs> I'm going with Central Florida. I don't care whether either one of you like oh, it. Oh, this is I my. I don't feel good either way about it. So I'll go with you. But yeah, I don't but feel it, good. See, here's the beauty of it, Watson. I can't just sit there and play Switzerland like you do. Well, why didn't you take another baseball game? Because there aren't any tonight. The there aren't. They're over. Ended. It's all day games. Okay. I had okay. no choice. Oh, so oh. you had to pick this. Yeah. Now, I even looked at the over-under, which is like 63, to see if maybe that was a better. Whew. Look, I'm not saying strong opinion like I did with 49ers. When you hear me say strong opinion, you go to the bank with it. Oh, yeah. I've heard that a bunch. Yeah. <laughs> I would say you're cautiously optimistic. I would, I would, I would wonder about so your percentage of buckets through my three years with you. I, I would just wonder what that percentage is. But it's not I, great, is I'm it? gonna, I'm gonna go against you tonight. Okay. I'm going Fine. with SMU. Okay. I, th I think that they've got a better offense, and they'll, they'll score, and they'll outscore them. So I'm going with SMU tonight. Man, okay. this is going to be fun to watch. I'm, I'm more excited to watch this. We may game. have to roll this tape back tomorrow. The bottom line is the best thing I've got going, the games at Central Florida. Yep, that's you true. Got, you got eight minutes to place your bets. <laughs> Watson, <laughs> behave until tomorrow. Well, watch the game. I'll be pulling for the Mustangs. See you later, Switzerland. <laughs> How do you that's plan bad. these? That's bad. That's bad. <laughs> Billy. <Bye. laughs> See you, Watson. Uh, Billy. George. Yeah, and improve your attitude as well. <laughs> My Start attitude. supporting me a little bit. Oh, it's just Don't fun. always just support him. It's just fine. <laughs> <laughs> All of you have a good evening. We'll see you tomorrow on Main Street Media Television.